All right. What's good, people? Hope everybody's well. Shout out to y'all. Yeah, I think we are in the building. All right. Already at 80 people. Good to see y'all. Make sure you hit the like button, like, share, subscribe, join, and donate if you would. Support the channel so we can continue to bring you independent black male thought. Keep in mind, this is the Onyx Report, where black male justice advocates uplift black men and boys using critical analysis. Damn, see, I got the sound thing happening again. Uh-oh. Let's see. Eh, it's a little better, but I'm going to have to reset everything. I thought I just finally had it straight, and it's doing this again. Anyway, my apologies to you, but it is what it is. Welcome back to the Onyx Report. Hope everybody is doing good. Shout out to the brothers that came through early. What's up, Andre? I'm listening. What's happening? Shout out to Malika. What's going on? Sam C with the first uh, super chat. Much appreciated. Says Scholar Tax. Thank you for that. Uh, Barry in the house, putting up critical information. Thank you, Barry. Chef Mike, what's up? Um, says, I'm happy to catch you live. <laughs> uh, when you're ready for vacation, I'll let me. Got a great spot. You can work on your next book while enjoying the beautiful beach view. That's what's up. Especially considering that uh, my son is heading back to school um, end of the weekend. And so I popped him over to the passport office and I got both of us our passports. I haven't had a passport since the early 90s um, and I just I didn't renew it, uh, you know, so it took me until now before I kind of got it together. So the passport process is in and I put in for the expedited one. So holla at me, chef, if you got some ideas on where a brother should head. You know what I'm saying? I am on sabbatical this semester. I will be doing some writing, but it would be nice to uh, do so at a different background. You know what I'm saying? So hit me up, man. Let me know what you're thinking. Um, so shout out to Chef Mike. Barry, appreciate that. Comes through with the early super chat as well. Says tuition drop and salute to the Onyx Brotherhood. Appreciate that. Uh, let's see. So we got Ebo Sosa. What's happening? We got MLR in the house. Shout out to MLR. What's good? We got Ron, Indigo Flow. Tim, what's going on? You know what I'm D Rock, what's up? Appreciate the super sticker. Thank you for that. Two Triv in the house. Shout out to BGS uh, Ibmore, putting it down. Hope you're well, good brother. Uh, John Smith, what's happening? Kadash, what's going on? My thoughts are freedom. What's up? He said, rock my hat today, upset a feminist. <laughs> what, you had to tell me which hat that was. Is that the one I'm thinking of? But uh, let me know my thoughts of freedom, which one that was. Pragmatic, what's going on? Dead set in the house. What's good? Always good to see you, man. Irvin, what's going on? Uh, Prince, what's happening? Christopher, LXST, what's up? KM, yeah. Smitty, what's up? We got Adrian. Ah, BGS says the chef owns a bistro on the Virgin Islands, huh? All right. Might have to do that. What's up, Forrest? Tyrone, what's going on? Uh, let me see. Adrian says Australia. Met with the Aboriginals in Australia. They see us, FBA, and black men of the West as brothers. Okay, that's what's up. What's going on, Paul? Uh, <laughs> Paul said, how many black women gave you dirty looks while you were applying for a passport? <laughs> oh, goodness. Luckily, none. I didn't see that. We made it through. My son has uh, made mention about uh, a possible a trip he would enjoy to the Philippines. So, you know, like, all right, we might have to think about that one. What's up, Cameron? What's good, Doc? You know, uh, Walter, what's happening? Greetings from the Bronx. That's what's up. Herb Saint, what's up? Um, oh, man, shout out to Herb. Or Herb, excuse me. Uh, thank you, Brother Hassan. Great book finished this week. Appreciate that, man. Thanks for supporting. And y'all make sure you do. If you still haven't, um, you know, go ahead and support the book. You can also, of course, support the channel. You know what to do. Uh, you can support on the Cash App, PayPal, Venmo, course on the super chat right here on youtube you can become a member of the onyx report on youtube hit that membership button or you can go to patreon and become a patron of the channel patron of the institute for black male studies for both and of course of course 
uh, join me on Patreon for live film viewing. So this Sunday, uh, BGS and I are going to be looking at um, uh, the film I reviewed not too long ago. Um, crap, here we go. Wasn't planning on mentioning it, but I think it might be good to do so. Because uh, it's been a little minute uh, since I did it, but um, leave the world behind. Yeah, so we're going to do a film review of that, live viewing. So, um, you know, join us on Patreon. All you got to do is choose the $5 membership, and you're welcome to come through, watch the film, comment, go back and forth, um, and analyze. So support uh, the channel. So that'll be this Sunday evening. Uh, and I'll put up a post on the community tab to let y'all know more as we get to it. And if you have not already, go ahead and pick up the book, uh, Solutions for Anti-Black Misandry, um, and check it out. So one of my former students just emailed, just uh, posted on Facebook, uh, what, yesterday. His mother got it for him as a gift. So that's all good. Shout out to my boy for that. Appreciate the support. Um, so let me get this. Make sure I am in the right spot. Okay. So, yeah, man. Got the passport process started. Paid for the expedited shipping. Y'all know what it is. So, holler back at me in two to three weeks. I'll let you know if it's come through. Um, Before we jump in, you know, something I wanted to definitely check out. Something I wanted to share with you guys. It's brief. And there's a couple of videos I wanted to play, but I, I can't play the sound because of copyright purposes. So that said, uh, the first part I wanted to start with was an acknowledgement in our Sacred Black Masculine series. Y'all know what we do. We honor brothers that are putting it in on one level or another, doing work that's quality, um, uplifting, you know, others. And doing so in a fashion that is consistent with what I've seen brothers do since time immemorial, even though they're often not credited with such. So that said, let me go ahead and share the screen. And since I'm not worried about sound on this one, the only thing I'm concerned with is whether or not y'all can see it. So let me go ahead and uh, put it completely up. All right. So you can see here, this is something that was sent on LinkedIn, and it has to do with the importance of black male teachers. And so you see this young man walking in, looking very down. You know what I mean? Now, less than, to my knowledge, 2% of black male teachers are still in the K through 12 system. But uh, what we do find uh, often, even though they're unacknowledged, is the impact they have on kids, most particularly black male kids. Right? So you can see this interaction here. And he's just engaging them, you know, talking to them. Gave him some energy and you see the kid walking away with a smile on his face. You know what I'm saying? So just a brief moment of acknowledgement. I'm not even, you know, I'm not even sure who the brother was. All I have from it is, uh, this is from Raymond J. Ankrum on LinkedIn. It says, chin up young fellow. This video highlights the importance of black men in education with less than 2% of teachers nationwide who identify as black men. We have to highlight our impact and I'm in agreement so I thought I'd share that just so we can be reminded of what others either try to forget, ignore, sweep under the rug, all of that. But at the end of the day, the impact that we have, and this continues into college and even graduate school. Um, so a couple of weeks ago, really a few weeks ago now, a couple of former students came through the house. Students that haven't been in my classroom in about a decade. And I've, I have others that haven't been in my class in two decades. And I often hear from them, uh, either through text or sometimes they come knocking up on the door and I still, you know, put a plate in front of them, give them a meal. We sit and have a conversation. They give me the update on where their lives are. And, you know, I give them some insight if it's at all useful. This is something that uh, brothers have been doing for the longest, but aren't credited with. So I just wanted to start tonight with a recognition of that presence, of that role that black men continue to play despite that they're not acknowledged for doing so. So shout out to that brother and shout out to all of you that do the job of inspiring mentees, sons, uh, boys. I don't care if you you coaching football or you serving as a big brother or a, a, a mentor as far as, you know, 
getting somebody on track with their business, whatever role it is. I just wanted to salute you because at the end of the day, it's what we need more of. And I know I benefited from it, so I can't help but pass it on. And hopefully some of the young brothers uh, coming up might find some of it of use. Right. So shout out for all of that. 181 watching. Hit the like button, please. so We can keep it going. Now, the other thing I wanted to do before I jumped into this book, too, is have a little fun. Uh, some of you may remember a couple of years ago that uh, when this when I first ran across this, I had to share it because it had me on the floor dying. And I did a show on it, you know, the female delusion calculator. And it basically has to do with, uh, you know, women in terms of the dating options they're looking for. Now, the reason I shared it is because I think it gave brothers a rare sense of how valuable in many situations we actually are, right? So this is at igotstandardsbro.com. And the guy who makes it, very little uh, that I can find on him. He's got a Twitter account, um, but he talks about uh, the reason he made it. He says, during my dating career as a man living in North America, I couldn't help noticing that women often have unrealistic expectations. They see themselves being passed around by those high quality men they feel entitled for failing to realize those few men are in high demand. Time passes, options shrink, their standards don't change, and they wonder why they're still single. These stats can prove they're not enough high quality men for every girl out there. Female delusion calculator is a tool that can help women discern what is realistic from what is highly unlikely. Now, the reason I found this entertaining is if you put in your own stats, you get a chance to find out, you know, where you kind of stand, you know. And so that was one of the interesting things about this one. Now, I have no idea how old it is, how new it is, but I just ran across a companion site made by, I, you know, the same creator. It's called the male reality calculator. <laughs> and so the male reality calculator gives you an opportunity to give, put in what you know, you're looking for. You can find it at realitycalc.com, C-A-L-C. So realitycalc.com, one word. And you can look into the male reality cal uh, calculator and you can put in the stats you're interested in and find out, uh, you know, where your interests stand in terms of the actual market. So just like the other calculator, uh, it's based on data and tied to income, height, race, and age, along with a few other qualifiers. Um, now, this is what it was set at when I opened it up, 18 to 29, uh, none of the buttons checked, and 411 to 58. Um, so uh, let's just, you know, we'll go with what's on here already. Um, let's exclude married, and uh, if we exclude mothers, I'll leave it at, well, let me put it at black women. Just, we're going to give a sense, to get a sense to where this is. 4.8 to 5.11 to, uh, to 5.8. Okay, well, let's, okay, so if we exclude obese, I'll even leave overweight. We'll just exclude obese. And you don't care about income. Let's just see. I haven't done this uh, with these stats. I just want to see what it tells us. So you can get a sense of what, how it works and what it looks like. So there you see the stats, my ideal woman, not married, no children, black, 411 to 58, not obese, and you don't care about income, according to this, in terms of probability. According to statistical data, the probability a woman of the U.S. female population ages 18 to 29 that meets your standards, 3.7%, roughly under a million women in the United States meet your ideal standards. So you can get a sense right there of how it works and what it looks like. And if you're interested in trying that out, I fell on the floor a few different times. And of course, you can manipulate the stats and play around with it and get a sense of, uh, you know, what you might find interesting. Uh, but I'd be curious to know both uh, for those listening live and for those who are listening on the replay gang, uh, what you found and, you know, what you think about it. But I posted it on my Facebook page and one brother said, you know, his, his results were 0.4 percent. And he said, Doc, what do you think I should do? As it sounds to me like you need to go get your passport, player. So that said, you know, I know I don't have to uh, inform my brothers here. <laughs> yeah, Andre, I left in overweight. <laughs> but, you know, they, granted, you know, black folk are only about 15 percent of the total population. So that might have played into that. But, you know, again, you can play with these. Um, like you put and push it to let's push it to 33. Um, 
will exclude married women, exclude mothers. I'll put race at any. Um, let me push this up to, I don't know, 511. I never really cared. But um, and let's say you want a minim minimum income of, I don't know, 30,000. Put that in. See all the things we put in there. Probability shoots up to about 11%. Now that's with all races. That's with it, all races open. So you're still looking at 11%. Now, you know, again, uh, play with it. Let's see. Uh, <laughs> Blazak one says not married, no children, black women between 411 and 59, not overweight and any income. 1.485%. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. That's what's up. Tyrone, I think Tyrone here is t might be talking about the uh, I Got Standards uh, site, the female delusional site. He says, uh, I got 0.5%. Real talk. Real talk. You find out that you, you know, a lot of brothers that uh, are in this these circles are, are kind of rare. So, yeah. So y'all check it out. I found it entertaining, if nothing else. But, uh, you know, be curious to know what kind of things you found. So, um Feel free to share it and let me know what you've come to. Um, so anyway, so let's get to it. So today we're dealing with, um, let me see, what's going on with this? Eh, hold on. System is acting a little weird. Okay, so I have to re- Redo the slide here. Bear with me for a second. And we will get this going. There's only a couple of sections I wanted to look at in this book. And if brothers are interested, we can always do a part two as well. Um, so we'll kind of go with it. But this is Richard Reeves and his book of Boys and Men, right? Came out last year. Um, you know, what's up, Art? Art new still in the house. What's going on? Uh, let's see here. Shout out to Ian Graves. I didn't see you uh, come through, but as usual, Ian is holding me down, putting up critical information. So I hope you're well, good brother. Um, anyway, so we're going to look through a little bit of this. Like I said, I'm not going to cover the whole book, but if there are sections that people would like to go through that I don't cover today, because I'm only going to be going through... Uh, sections of a couple of chapters just to kind of give you a sense of where he's coming from and what I think about some of what he's doing. Now, to me, Reeves is, you know, kind of the face of what they're attempting to build. And I think what they're attempting to build is a kind of a politically correct manosphere. Um, they're trying to do this. It's coming out of the left, of course, and they're looking at trying to find ways to identify issues that men and boys are going through that, um, you know, society, i.e. women won't find offensive. And I think this is, is problematic on a particular level. I mean, I understand it and it's not that I'm looking to be as rude and, and, and whatever as possible. It's not that, but I do think that, you know, one of the benefits of what I've seen in the manosphere is you have brothers that are actually not prioritizing how women feel to get at truth. And I think that's an important quality to maintain. Now, it doesn't mean you got to go off and, and you know, um, find every way possible to be as offensive as possible. I, I don't even think that's necessary. But I do think what's necessary is to maintain the integrity of looking at black male uh, issues and male issues in general um, and not making it about how women feel. And I think this is one of the things that's it's one of the things that I think pulls back on the potency of the book. Uh, as well as the potency of the movement, because again, it still remains gynophocal. It still remains overly concerned about how upset women might feel. And keep keep in mind, there are many women that are upset simply because you've written a book that deals with males and boys. If you don't primarily focus on girls, women, and LGBT, you find people will dismiss you and call you a misogynist, a sexist, and every word in the book simply because of the gesture. And I think this is one of the things that Reeves and others like him are trying to move around. Now, I don't think he's soft. 
I think he's moving strategically and he's trying to move strategically in circles that uh, probably require that. But my issue is simply that once you start to pick away at the integrity of the issue and you make it too much about how people feel, how women feel, how girls feel, how, you know, it, you already going to begin to um, water down and really sweep under the rug some of the critical issues that I think boys and men face, most particularly black boys and black men, you know, simply as a matter of being too overly concerned. Now, that to me is a problem. That was my problem when I first started to talk about this new sector, you know, because I've already seen them, you know, engage a couple of articles and stuff online. And and usually when they're brought up onto talk shows and news, you know, interviews, they'll be put right next to a woman. And she'll give her thoughts about it and, and whatnot. And, and they'll kind of come in fairly apologetic, right? Almost kind of, you know, suggesting that there's there's almost a reason to apologize for us even having this conversation. And I think that posture in and of itself is already a bit of a problem for me. You know, might be a taste issue. The question will be answered as we get down the line. And when the critical need of boys and men kicks in, especially in regard to policy, the question will become, how well does this apologetic apologetic uh, posture work? How impactful is it? Is it costing us by always stepping out of our shoes to give them to someone else simply because you don't want to offend them? Does that work? I, I, I generally don't think it does. Now, I didn't have time to scan it. Um, so I'm going to read through some sections of it and we'll kind of talk as we go um, regarding some of this. So I'm looking at if you have the book, I'm looking at uh, Boys and Men, of course, page 46. And this is the chapter that Reeves dedicates to black men and boys. And it starts out, it's actually entitled Dwight's Glasses. And he's talking about his godson. And he has a conversation with him and I think a table full of black men. And they start talking about wearing glasses as a defense mechanism in society. It's a way of, you know, deflecting white angst, right? White racism. And the idea is that uh, if you wear glasses, people will not be as threatened by you. And he was surprised that his godson knew this and that he didn't. And he, you know, started to understand that there was a whole reality in regard to black male existence that he was unaware of. Navigating masculinity in ways that disarm uh, whites in terms of, you know, taking black maleness as a threat. Um let's see, AI Apostle says this book is good, especially chapter two. Okay, that's what we're, we're kind of go, going through a little bit now. Uh, D. Scott, appreciate that. He calls it Manosphere Light. <laughs> right. And, I, and I'll bet money. They listen to what brothers are saying in the Manosphere. It's just, I think their interest is how can we, if we find sections of it relevant, and I, think, I do think they do, how can we kind of, you know, sanitize it so it's not offensive? Um, again, although I'm not looking to offend um, I think there's value in, you know, being truthful more so than worrying about how other people may take it. I do think there's value in it. I don't think you got to go out your way to be offensive, but if you over, if you over prioritize, you know, worrying about other people and what they're going to take and what they're not going to take, I think it costs the truth. That's what I fundamentally believe. And I'm saying that in a community that has downplayed black males for decades. I mean, the only time we, we really heard about black males is when it came to prison and, of course, the drug wars. That was it. Short of that, you know, what was often brought up was, you know, uh, framed around abuse. It was framed around black male, uh, black men being monsters, even black boys. Right. And really resulting in a, con a level of contempt that I've not seen in almost any other community. I think, you know, maybe Asian women. And their perspectives on Asian men may come uh, second, but short of that, the hostility between the genders is, is is framed in Black America in a way that I haven't seen anywhere. So anyway, that's what Dwight's glasses has to do with. Now I'm going to read a section where he, he's entitled this "Reverse Sexism," and this is uh, the chapter is not very long, uh, but I'm going to read portions of it and we'll kind of go into a little of uh, you know my thoughts about his argument. Um, and like I said, I might do a part two, you know, or so on, so on. So let me know your thoughts. Let me know uh, what you'd like to engage and we can do that. Shout out to Ghetto User. Um, shout out to Mr. Blue Collars. Good to see you, man. Hope you're well. All right. So let's get into it. So this section is called Reverse Sexism. And uh, it reads, in the late 1980s, and 90s, a breakthrough occurred in the study 
of inequality and discrimination for the development of intersectionality. Pioneered by Kimberly Crenshaw, this framework was initially grounded in Black feminism, but it provides a way to examine how different forms of oppression operate in combination. Rather than seeing inequality in binary terms such as male, female, black, white, rich, poor, gay, straight, Crenshaw insists on the complexities of compoundedness. The power of intersectional thinking derived from its inescapable plural, pluralism, excuse me. Each of us are multiply identified. You may be a black heterosexual Jewish social lawyer, socialist lawyer. I may be a white gay atheist liberation coal miner. Uh, this, let me put this light on it. This insistence on plural identities echoes centuries of progressive liberal thought from John Stuart Mill and Harriet uh, Taylor Mill in the 19th century to uh, Amartya Sen and Martha Nussbaum in the 21st. Crenshaw centers her work on black women, but the framework can be used more broadly and the position of any particular group is not fixed in relation to that of another group. Now, this is this is interesting because even though Crenshaw develops this in relation to black feminism, I don't think many black theorists, black fem feminist theorists expected the concept of intersectionality to be appropriated by mainstream America. So even though they kind of sold it as something that could be used to locate yourself on this newly developed kind of hierarchy, because it went beyond. See, what he's presenting here is that intersectionality, you know, just kind of showed you that we all had multiple identifiers. But what in shorthand, what it ended up becoming was this kind of uh, grade system where you were graded on where you fit in the hierarchy of oppression. And that framed how much we needed to listen to you, how much positionality you should have in the discussion. And there were actually books that I've covered on this channel in the last year that where you had uh, you know, almost DEI workers, but people going into and giving workshops and schools and things of that nature. And they would determine who gets to speak based on where they kind of located themselves or where they fit, I should say, in the intersectional hierarchical framework. So it, it, in the shorthand, it, it began to be used uh, as a marker. Um, and, it, and I think that in, in and of itself became a bit problematic. But my point in bringing this up was that even though feminists sold it, Black feminists sold it as something that could be used to really highlight where we all fit, I don't think they fully liked where it went because it got appropriated and it, became, it really be, became something used out of their hands. Um, shout out to Wu. Says six foot two, 250 pounds, been profiled before. Hope the glasses help. <laughs> right. I was talking to my son about that today, as a matter of fact, as we were leaving the passport office. One of the things he said is he said, he said, Dad, I think I have resting bitch face. He said, because people look at me and he, I guess he had just walked down the hall as we were coming out and somebody was, you know, thought he was mean mugging him. And, uh, you know, now that's important for black males. We had to have this conversation again because he's six foot ten. Right. So you'll have people that, you know, may be overly afraid and may overreact to his detriment simply because they're afraid. So this conversation is relevant. So I started to talk to him about an article that came out a while back referring to, uh, you know, whistling Vivaldi. Right. And this idea that if you whistle, you know, music that whites like, especially classical music, you, you off put and offset the potential fear they have that may end up in a loss of your life. And there's a lot of ways to do that. So there's glasses. There's whistling. There's, um, you know, the kind of clothes we wear. Of course, there's wearing the big smile, uh, saying hello, you know, in, in a very light toned way. And that's one of the things we talk about, too. You know, the way men's voices can go up octaves and you speak with a different tone simply because you don't want to intimidate and scare people. And that particularly impacts you if you're larger. And I'm not 6'10", I'm 6'2", but I'm over 300. And, you know, it, it's not hard for people to be intimidated by me. And I've always had to be concerned about how that may impact what others may do to me. And so that conversation is key. And we ended up having to have it organically this morning yet again, because I have to make sure he at least understands. Now, what he chooses to do about it is a whole nother question, but at least know it's something you need to be concerned about. And those are things that we talk to our sons about on a regular basis, because it could be the difference between life and death. You know what I mean? So wearing glasses is one. I even saw uh, one of the uh, comedians. Oh, man, his name escapes me. He kind of has locks at the top. Uh, he's an African brother. Some of you guys will probably remember his name better than I would. But he did a he did a skit on, on I think it was on YouTube where he was talking about, you know, carrying around a Starbucks cup. Because uh, he said that made whites feel comfortable, you know, that he's carrying a Star Starbucks cup. And so he's standing there with his whole crew and they're passing around the cup, pretending to drink from it. 
so as to demonstrate how this offsets people's fear of black men. It may be ridiculous, but this is the shit we deal with. Shout out to Wanna Be Mystic. Says, but, but Dr. T, I thought the black woman was God. <laughs> Y'all crazy. Uh, shout out to David. Says, from the official sponsor of Dr. T. Asan Johnson, Black Men. Much appreciated. Thank you. Shout out. What's up, Stuart? Good to see you in the house. Ghost Elmatic, what's up? Let me see. So, yeah, Godfrey. Thank you, M. Lavo. Uh, Joseph, I uh, appreciate that. And Malika, yeah, Godfrey. Uh, it's it's an interesting skit to watch, but it, it as absurd as it sounds, it, it is the reality of what a lot of brothers contemplate and the information you share. And that also goes down to how you dress. You know, it all I mean, black men have been been juggling these issues for, you know, generations. So it's not new. Right. But what Reeves is telling us is he's just coming into this. So anyway. As we get to this, so I just wanted to point out that whole notion of intersectionality is something that ended up being appropriated uh, from black feminists. And I don't think they like how it's being used. More importantly, I don't think they like how they are not uh, really referenced anymore in relation to it. You know, it used to be, you know, where you would see people cite Kimberly Crenshaw and he does so. He's a scholar. I expect that. But in casual conversation and professional development workshops, when I hear people teaching and talking about intersectionality, it's rarely associated with black feminism. Black feminism isn't even articulated in terms of how the concept is being sold in the mainstream, which is, of course, what we saw with Me Too and everything else. It kind of gets appropriated and, you know, kind of goes from there. But anyway, so uh, let me see. As my colleague Tiffany N. Ford, a public health scholar, writes of intersectional approaches, social categories are contextuals or contextual fundamental traits are not fixed but rather constantly changing over time. Now, it's interesting because they say this when they're talking about intersectionality, but black men become locked as one category. We are, in many respects, we are treated as a locked category. We're not fixed. Even though uh, my, my work, uh, Dr. Curry's work, many others in black male studies have been talking about really a, a form of positionality that's not a product of intersectionality. It actually comes out of black scholars' work uh, before Crenshaw's. Yet and still, we're still black men in the casual settings and mainstream settings are still treated as if they have no uh, fluidity of identity. But everybody else does. Right. Black men become locked in a particular way as monsters, despite that the concept itself that they're selling to the world uh, promotes this kind of fluidity. Anyway, um, what it means to be queer or black or male, see how they always make those things interchangeable. And that's one of the other things that I think uh, intersectionality kind of did. It made, you know, whole experiences interchangeable. So race, gender, sexuality, all these things just become inter interchangeable categories. Right. And so now, as long as you can insert one, you, you can kind of reframe and rejigger your hierarchical status based on, you know, how oppressed the category you chose was which I think can be an ahistorical, you know, practice in and of itself, right? You have a slave trade on the basis of race as a concept. That's not the same. That doesn't come out of the same history as everything else, but it's all jumbled together in this kind of way where it's used in a very shorthand fashion and disassociated, right? Pulled out of time and space and used as an abstract category that can be replaced and checked almost like we're playing a card game. So in and of itself, that I find problematic, but that's what I think is has started to happen with this. Patterns of advantage and disadvantage are not set in stone. So anti-Black gendered racism hurts Black men and Black women, but not in the same way. Gender is racialized and race is gendered in different ways, in different places and at different times. I agree. Consider the conservative archetype of the welfare queen, a gendered lens through which to pathologize Black women receiving public assistance. Now, He's using this example to demonstrate his point. But remember, the chapter is on black and men, excuse me, is on black men, right? In a book called Of Boys and Men. So even in that first gesture of citing the welfare queen as an example, right, of what, he, what we're trying to find, fight against in this kind of way, tells you who his audience is. He's not actually talking to black men and boys directly. I'm sure, you know, he's, he's not upset if black men and boys are reading the book, but you could tell that his audience is, is not necessarily what you might expect. But let's continue. This is where he actually cites Tommy, which is which is critical. 
Um, black men face different inter intersections of disadvantage, many of which may be more acute than those faced by black women. As Tommy Curry, chair of Africana uh, Philosophy and Black Male Studies at the University of Edinburgh writes, in liberal arts fields, it is assumed that because black and brown men's gender is masculine, there is an innate advantage they have over all women and are patriarchal. But Curry argues that the opposite is true. The man not, race, class, genre, and the dilemmas of manhood, he argues that black males in the U.S. are oppressed, racialized men. Curry urges that uh, urges the creation of a new scholarly field of black male studies on the grounds that the accounts offered by existing feminist and intersectional scholars are missing the mark when it comes to the specific forms of gender racism faced by black men. But the challenge is not just in academia. Efforts on uh, efforts to focus on the specific change challenges of black boys and men are often viewed with suspicion as distractions from the challenges of black women or people of other races and ethnicities. I want to be clear about my own position. I believe that the deepest uh, American prejudices are rooted in anti-black racism, specifically toward the people that legal scholar Cheryl uh, Cashin calls descendants. Now, this is key. The politics of citation. Right? This is something that black feminists are you're pretty good at. They cite each other on a regular basis. Uh, this is something that Tommy has been pushing and I've been in, in agreement with. Green Gorilla has been in agreement with Dr. Neal. We need to cite each other more. This is something women do. Not necessarily something I think black men do enough of. But what we can see here in this text is who he's citing. So he's making it clear to you that even though he's talking about boys and men, he's he's not limited to that. He's not locked into boys and men. He's citing women. So the women that are reading this can feel comfortable that this is not the manosphere. This is not hostile to you. You don't have to be threatened by it. Um, and you can feel safe. Now, again, that's not where I would put my priorities, but I understand what he's doing. I don't agree with it myself, but the book is here. Hopefully the information will help. Shout out to Hurricane Greg. He says, coochie boot warrior tax. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. You know, uh, let's see. Yeah. Lauren says uh, black men have to pretend to be assimilated, a Borg, if you will. Yeah. There we go. 334 watching. Hit the like button, please support the channel so we can continue to do it. But, you know, these are the kind of little things that I'm talking about. So even the citations are political. Right. And, and, and so you can see the kind of statements being made. He's citing Tommy which is great. He even gives a paragraph on his thoughts, you know, uh, not even on his thoughts on Tommy. He gives a paragraph to summarizing Tommy, which is great. But right after Tommy, he's citing woman. And I think the reason politically is to make sure that he tells people, I'm not tied in with these guys to too great a degree. They're doing some work. Tommy's doing some work. It's important. But, you know, I'm not locked in because we, 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 we can't have this conversation and bolster too many men. Uh, because we don't want to threaten the women who are a part of this, and we definitely don't want them upset with us. And so it continues. Um, African Americans who descend from the long legacy of slavery, um, oh, that was a continuation of the last sentence where he's quoting Cashin. Um, For this reason, among others, I don't much like the term people of color or the idea that the main dividing line is between white Americans and everybody else. I understand the need to build coalitions. I also understand the desire not to appear to be downplaying racism for other groups. But the idea that all people who are not white are in a similar position to that of black Americans is both morally offensive and empirically wrong. Anti-black racism is the main challenge, and it is uh, at least as great for black men as for black women. Now, you know, a lot of the work we're doing in black male studies is actually about foregrounding anti-black misandry. So it's not to say anti-black racism is unimportant, but we're also having a very particular conversation about the nature of misandry in regard to that anti-black component. It is specific to black men and boys. It is not arbitrary. It is not purely a racial dynamic. It is race and gendered in regard to how it impacts black men. That is the conversation that many of us are having in these circles, and we want to do so unapologetically does not mean women can't participate, doesn't mean that we won't cite from women, but it simply means that that's not the priority. The priority is not worrying about how people feel. Because truth be told, people are offended at the existence of the conversation, the existence of the discourse in and of itself offends people. And if we keep leaving it at what's who's offended by what, we're going to find ourselves 
constantly hopping from one foot to the other, trying to tap dance to make people happy. I particularly don't care to do that. Um, and it is what it is. So just want to get that out. So then he has a section right after that called Hard Facts on Black Men. It says uh, Dwight, he's talking again about his godson, spent the first 11 years of his life living in Rosemont, um, West Baltimore. Okay, I'm not, I don't know. I'm not going to go through all of this as much, but I will share some of it because I do want to highlight that he's, his, his approach is, is empirical. And I think that's important. Uh, and I appreciate that. Much of his work is empirical. If you look up articles by Reeves, a lot of it is empirical. And I, and I think that push is necessary. But I also think it's a product of you know conversations that men have had to start on their own because they weren't getting any mainstream attention or support to do so. Uh, that includes the manosphere, that includes black male studies, that impl includes movements um, eh, that may have even been kind of uh, kind of sidelined in the academy. But in an organic way, you've had collectives of men with slightly different vibrations in their approach who have been having these conversations. And this is what spawns the conversation we're having now. And it's necessary because if we waited on mainstream society to do it, it wouldn't have happened. But I think the other key to it is that there is importance, you know, as far as the manosphere's existence, so even though people don't want to acknowledge that and they want to label it a certain way, there's a critical, it's critically important that the manosphere exists. You need a space that is wholly unapologetic to kick the goddamn door in and put things on the table. You don't get a Reeves, or I won't say Reeves as an individual person, but you don't get the kind of conversation Reeves wants to have and it doesn't get listened to unless you have something that scares the shit out of the rest of the country or the world for that matter, right? And that's what the Manosphere is, right? That's the Malcolm to your Martin. In other words, and I'm not saying Reeves is Martin, but the approach, if you're going to have a conversation about something that people don't really want to hear much about, you can try to have it and you can hope that people will listen, but it's not often until they see something they're terrified of that they look for the alternative. And what they're terrified of is a lot of pissed off young men who they can no longer identify with. And this is one of the things that's been happening. So a lot of these people are living with those very pissed off young men. Same little boy a little while ago was playing video games and he was their baby. Now he is pissed off and they don't understand why. And so those young men be you know, began to look for a way to express that. So what you have here is people trying to build an alternative, right, to the manosphere, and yet at the same time trying to push for policy. I hope it works. I'm good with that. As long as it's an empirically based movement, in some way or another, I'll support it. But I think the difference between, you know, people like myself and people like Reeves, aside from the massive resources that are available to them, is that, you know, my primary concern is not who's offended by what I have to say. And the reason I'm doing that, too, is because I grew up. As one of these young men, I grew up as many of the black men listening to this broadcast who were trained in a gynocracy to operate and regard women before themselves, regard women's feelings, perspectives and worldview as, as a priority before they even figure out what they think and feel about what's going on. We were told that we were deadbeat fathers. We were told that we were trifling. We were told that, you know, uh, the women were better than us, they were smarter than us, and if, and if we didn't support them well enough, that we were misogynist. We were told all these things from boyhood. But nobody asked us what we thought. Nobody asked us our opinion, our perspective. And for many of us, it took the last 10 to 15 years before we started to congregate and have these conversations. We started to compare notes, compare experiences, and realize that we had some things in common that we were not allowed to talk to and had no real platform for. Nobody was coming asking us to make the male, the black male color purple. Nobody was knocking on our doors saying, hey, come tell your story. We'll give you a platform. That wasn't happening. We had to do that ourselves. And just the very gesture of it, just the, even at the very beginnings of it, we were met with hostility even within the Black community, most particularly within the Black community, right? We were met with hostility. So that said, many of us began to have a conversation anyway. And there were some of us that really, you know, got real bold and gave an F you to anybody that didn't like it. Some of us, you know, so our responses range. You have some cats that wanted to explain and compliment and, and hope that people will listen. 
You had others that stuck the middle finger up and you had others who just ignored anybody mainstream. But my point is, we developed a space where brothers could have a conversation, sometimes contentious, that was independent of prioritizing anybody else's feelings. And I think there's value in that kind of discourse. I think there's value in it. And I want to make sure we don't lose the baby with the bathwater as we try to push policy, as we try to transition this into different spaces. Uh, I just want to be clear, making people feel good is not always the point. And it doesn't mean you have to go out your way to hurt people either, but it just means we're having a particular conversation. And I honor the black boys and men that I'm having this conversation enough about. I honor them enough to say that I'm not going to make your feelings my focus. My focus is on the experiences of those males and, and those men and what we can prove, what we can understand, especially empirically speaking, and what needs to be brought to the fore, what needs to be talked about that's been swept under the rug. And what I've also found about this is the more I started to do this work, when I sat down with my fathers, when I sat down with men who were old enough to be my grandfathers, all the way down to boys who are young enough to be my son, or technically speaking, maybe even grandson at this point. When I talk to these boys and men, I find that they actually can identify with things. And sometimes, especially with the older ones, give me insight onto how those issues came up in the past, sometimes in ways that I've never even heard before. But my point, and, and matter of fact, Kevin used to talk about this too. Kevin Samuels used to talk about how older men would run, run up on him and thank him for his work and sometimes break into tears. And I've experienced this as well with men my grandfather's age who broke into tears because we were starting to articulate things that they had been experiencing for generations that nobody bothered to listen to them about. They didn't have a language or vocabulary for and damn sure didn't have a platform to talk about. It. So you can't tell me this is, doesn't have value. It clearly does. And Reeves' willingness to even step his, dip his toe into it, so, you know, lets, it confirms the value of it. But I don't want us to trade the baby for the bathwater. I really don't want us to lose sight of what's important about this conversation. And it isn't what people like or don't like about it. Um, okay. So he says, uh, Dwight is from Baltimore. Or as the U.S. Census Bureau would put it, track 245-101-60700. It was a Black neighborhood then. It's a Black neighborhood now. By Baltimore standards, the outcomes for children from Rosemont um, are not too bad. But this is not the same as saying that they are good in terms of adult outcomes. Baltimore is one of the worst places in America to grow up as a boy. Among the boys born around 1980 into low-income families, Dwight's cohort in Rosemont, one in seven, that's about 16%, were in prison on April 1st, 2010. To be clear, not that they had been to prison by April 1st, but that they were in prison on that date. In fact, more of these boys became prisoners than became husbands. The marriage rate for this cohort by their mid-30s was about 11%. One in three were still living in, neighbor, in the neighborhood, which means their children will likely go to the local Belmont Elementary School. All of Belmont's students are Black. To say that the outcomes from the school are poor would be, to be, would be an understatement. At the elementary level, my, uh, my children attended in Beth Bethesda. 82% of the students uh, cleared Maryland's proficiency, proficiency standards in math and... and uh, I'm sorry, my light is messing with me here. There we go. So he's saying in, in where he sent his school, his kids to elementary school in Bethesda, 82 percent of the students cleared Maryland's proficiency standards in math in 2019. Statewide, the proportion was 58 percent. At Belmont, it was one percent. Scale of our failure here is almost incomprehensible, right? So 85, 82% where he sent his kids to school, 1% in Belmont, right? This is the contrast we're looking at. Shout out to Donnie. Uh, appreciate the 999. He says, based off the history lesson from BGS, the government is very concerned with a new generation of galvanized men when the current system no longer serves them and they want change. Indeed. Shout out to J Block. J Block. He says, uh, what I love about the black manosphere, it's the other side of the coin. Right. And that's why I'm, I'm, I'm really focused on maintaining the integrity uh, that we have here of being able to speak unpopular truths, because once you sell that out, you don't get that back. You don't get that back. Shout out to M. Lavo. He says, I work in high schools and young men are rejecting women first 
first notions. In my high school years, we didn't question this. We used to get girls. Not so much now. It's real talk. That's real talk. Um, girls and women are being asked questions they've never been asked before. They've been asked to perform in ways they've never been asked before. You know, um, Kobe, 42, says uh, the burden of the brutalized is not the comfort is not to comfort the bystander. Thank you, Dr. T, BGS, Dr. Neil, and other scholars for giving us the tools to stay ready. Much appreciated. Thank you for that. Now, um, LXST says Bethesda ain't no cheap school either. A lot of affluent people go there. Okay. Well, you can, and you can kind of look at the numbers and tell. Um, so those are the kind of numbers he gives in this section. And he mentions some of Raj Chetty's work, which is important because some of the takeaways from Raj Chetty's epic uh, study on black males found that, uh, well, I'll read a little bit of that section. I don't want to go through the whole thing in that. He says, Ross Chetty and his team at Opportunity Insights have crunched the numbers of 20 million Americans born around 1980 to look closely at intergenerational patterns of poverty and mobility. They find that black men are much less likely than white men to rise up the income ladder, while black and white women raised by poor parents have similar rates of upward integrational uh, mobility. Chetty and his team conclude that the overall black-white intergenerational mobility gap is entirely driven by differences in men's, not women's, outcomes. And that was key. The other thing about Chetty's work that was, was, was incredibly interesting was that when he traced white and black uh, affluent you know, youth, what he found was that black men had the greatest chance of falling out of that wealth status, right? So not only did they have the most difficult time climbing into the upper echelons of wealth, they had the easiest time falling out of the upper echelons of wealth, even more so than black women. And this is why it helped us to kind of differentiate, right? Because, you know, it was for so long we've been using this language that the black experience is just, you know, the same on the basis of race. But we found that there are gendered ideas that have a dramatic impact on how all of that is played out. Now, let me see. What else in this do I want to go through? Um, let's see. Okay, I'm, I'm going to skip through the education part. I might come back to that once I scan this and put it up. Um, hold on. Let's see where I decided to put it. And, da, 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 da. Okay. And some good information on employment and education. Um, let's see what I want to stick with. I might jump around here. So let me look at the Black family section. I may go back later. Um, there's something else I want to cover. And like I said, if you guys want to, to kind of go through this with a more fine tooth comb, we can do a part two and we can actually pick out sections to go to if you'd like. But I'm looking at a section on page 56 called The Black Family Under Stress. And it starts, Black women have always played a more important economic role in the family, especially compared to white women. Even today, inequality shapes racial differences in family life. Half of Black women raising children are doing so without a husband or cohabitating partner, in stark contrast to women of other racial groups, especially whites. Black mothers are three times as likely as white mothers to be single parents, 52% versus 16%, and half as likely to be living with a spouse, 41% versus 78%. Most births to Black women take place outside marriage, around 70%, compared to about half of the births to Hispanic women and 28% of those uh, to white women. A comprehensive study of marital trends by Kelly Rayleigh, Megan Sweeney, and Danielle Wandra concludes that compared to both white and Hispanic women, Black women marry later in life, uh, are less likely to marry at all, and have highly uh, higher rates of marital instability. Okay. Um, black women in their early 40s are five times as likely as white women of the same age to have married, 34 versus 7%. Black marriage has been undermined by anti-Black racism, including by the specific challenges faced by Black men. In the sociological classic, the Truly Disadvantaged, published in 1990, William Julius Wilson argued that dire economic conditions create a smaller pool of marriageable men, so fewer couples tie the knot. Now, again, he takes the time in this section on Black men to highlight Black women. 
and the woes and the difficulties they face. And I think much of this is because this is how we're taught to study black people, right? Again, we keep, we keep having to foreground the women. Now, we've covered this same information on this show, in my book, in Tommy's book, a number of other authors' books. We've covered the same information, but many of many people don't know how to do so and look at it from a black male perspective. So if you want to talk about um, single parent households, you want to talk about divorce rates, we continue to do this with a frame for how black women have articulated their experience. And we've been doing it for so long, we don't even think about it. This is, this is mainstream. As you can tell with Reeves, this, this is not coming from the Black community, but this is what many have been taught about how to study Black folk. We have to do it from this vantage point. Few ask the question from a Black male standpoint, which is uh, something I did in a piece a uh, long time ago. I put it on my blog, as a matter of fact. I wrote it on the blog most particularly um, because I knew that it wasn't necessarily going to be something that was going to be found or, and published easily. I took a five-year hiatus off of uh, publishing, working on YouTube, because I didn't want to hear publishing companies tell me what they wanted to share and what they did, what people wanted to read and what they didn't. So here's a piece that I put out, uh, and you can see it's dated uh, 2018, right? Why was Black Generation X fatherless? A brief statement on why many Black men left the family of the 70s, right? Um, now, I'm not going to go through this whole thing because I'm still not done with looking at Reeves, of course, but I just want to point out, I start this blog piece with bullet points, issues that directly impact Black men and their presence in families, and raise the question of, to the extent that Black men are not present, because I think there's been some over-exaggerations on that too, how much of that is due to systemic reasons that are not just the standard systemic, systemic ones we hear from. Yeah, he's talking about it here, anti-Black racism. We hear about it from a variety of different vantage points, and that's fine. But I also raise that there are resources and institutions available to women in order that they, that they can actually leverage against Black men that in many ways have chased some Black men from the family. So you got the typical narrative that you have the deadbeat dads. I'm arguing there's also a narrative been able to chase men out of the family because of resources and capabilities that they've gotten from the state, most particularly through family court and through the use of the police and so on and so forth, that they can leverage against Black men that they're frustrated, frustrated at, right? And then, of course, the other alternative that I raise in this blog piece is a third option. And that third option is you do have some men who have actually protested marriage and family since the 1960s. And if you look at the rates, and I talk about this in the blog piece, many of these men actually began in the 60s to step away from marriage. They saw the impact even then of family and families and policy and how that inadvertently impacted Black men. So I'm, I'm saying that there are at least three models we can look at for understanding Black men. But the traditional model that everybody goes with is the deadbeat narrative. Right. Uh, shout out to Andre. He says, thanks for what you do, Doc. We need black men to speak for and black men in spaces where we can be honest instead of sugarcoating it not to offend. Exactly. Exactly. Because here's the other thing. Who's sugarcoating shit for us? Who? Are black women sugarcoating their perspectives on us? Hell no. Nobody is. But the expectation that black men sugarcoat and soft shoe is consistent and always has been. And when black men stop prioritizing other people's feelings, it scares the hell out of folks. And so you have, you know, women that respond with hostility. And then you have this new mainstream approach at a new kind of publicly acceptable manosphere that wants to soft shoe it all together. Right. So here he's actually using a pretty standard, you know, kind of approach to understanding the black family that really, you know, kind of comes out of the feminist narratives we've been hearing about for the longest. Um, let's see here. Okay. Uh, so let me see. So he said, uh, Wilson. Okay. He says, um, so here he goes. He says, I've always been uncomfortable with this argument because male marriage ability is based on stereotypical assumptions to be marriageable. A man has to be a breadwinner. How outdated and sexist. The trouble is that most people, including most black people agree with Wilson. 
breadwinning potential is highly prized and a potential uh, mate. 84% of Black Americans say that in order to be a good husband uh, or partner, it is very important for a man to be able to provide uh, for their family financially, compared to 67% of white respondents, right? But the gap is even wider when it comes to female providers. 52% of Black Americans say it is important for women to be able to financially support their family compared to just 27% of whites. Given the economic challenges faced facing Black women and men, this is not surprising. But while Black women are seeing more improvement in their educational and economic positions and therefore their ability to fill the breadwinning role, Black men are falling way behind. Well, one of the things he's also missing, though, that dramatically impacts Black coupling is that even though you have women to advocate that women should be able to make more and make more and have all kinds of gender roles that are fluid and open so that they can play any role they want, there's still a strong expectation, even at the dating phase, that Black men be providers. Women are actually asking for men to start paying their bills within the first week or two of meeting them. And that's not new. I've heard that for generations. I've heard that in the 1980s. A woman you just met in the last week expects you to start paying her bills at the dating stage. If she's expecting that then, what is she expecting by the time you talk about marriage? So even though she might be making a good paycheck, uh, which is something that politically we're seeing women advocate for, that doesn't mean that they necessarily want to be breadwinners. What they actually want is for men to be the breadwinners while they make money that they can use at their own discretion that he has no say over. See, this is the key to it, right? The breadwinning argument is complicated in the black community, but women want men to be bread breadwinners. Men want men to be breadwinners, but women want to make as much money or more that they don't have to expend on family unless they choose to. And I've been asked this even personally by women I've dated, women who are doing well in the work market, you know, who are making good money, sometimes in the six figure range and sometimes more than that. But the expectation was no matter how much they made, I needed to pay the bills. I needed to take care of the kids. I needed to I needed to provide for all of the, the basics of her household, right? It doesn't even matter if we live together. I need to provide the basics for her household and her money. And we've heard this all before, the, the mantra, right? Your money is our money. My money is my money in terms of what women are telling men. So even though he's covering this issue about breadwinners and he's talking, you know, about some of the statistics around employment and income, and of course, this is impacted by education and the economy in and of itself, the social expectation that men still provide a somewhat, you know, traditional role in the family while at the same time be asked to step back in terms of decision making and be asked to step back in terms of expecting anything of whatever income she may earn. This does not work in the real world. The 50-50 marriage dynamic that we hear about, as long as it's rooted in those kinds of social expectations, which have become normalized in the Black community, does not work. So when you go with these conventional ideas, even though you're looking at the data, what you're missing is what Black men experience. Not just what This is not just about what Black women want. This is also about what Black men experience, because here's the other part to it. Men often report that when they actually do try to play these partner roles, when they actually do try to meet women's expectations and follow women's edicts about how they're supposed to act, they're not respected. They're taken for granted. They're used. They're seen as, you know, tools. Now, in the traditional dynamic, that used to be an exchange of respect. There used to be an exchange of resources and so on and so forth. We've talked about this many times. What fem feminism in particular and Black feminism even more so did was it cherry picked what it liked about traditional gender roles and left the rest? Ate the banana, left the peel, right? Get whatever I can get from him, give nothing. Or at least give him what I think he should have in exchange for what I want. No question about what the values actually are. And this is where the dating and marriage market come in. You know, this is why the Manosphere uh, conversation in the last three years, most particularly, has been so critical, because once we hit the pandemic, once we started to see people struggling, the realities of the market were now no longer something we could ignore. Women in particular could no longer ignore. So even though they're still making the same crazy kinds of demands all over social media and whatnot and in private conversations, the reality of what they can actually get, which is one of the reasons I brought up the uh, the, the you know, dating calendar uh, calculators that I post, 
are challenging that and making it impossible. In other words, men are suggesting that if you are not going to even bother to listen to what it is we're looking for in relationships, we're done with the conversation. That's a, that's a new dynamic, you know, generationally speaking. We hadn't seen that before. We're starting to see more of it. Um, shout out to Passport OG. I know I saw him in there, so I wanted to just pop, pop him up. You can't post paying rent on Instagram. <laughs> shout out to Passport OG. I hope you well, man. Uh, doing some critical uh, uh, stuff on his channel, so support the Passport OG channel if you haven't. I see you, Gail. Hope you're well. All right. So anyway. Let's continue a little bit more uh, into what he's talking about here, right? Um, he says, I hope it's clear that I'm not arguing for somehow elevating black men above black women. See, but nobody has a problem with black women being elevated above black men, right? Nobody has a problem with that. But he still has to apologize in a section, in a chapter that's supposed to be about black men and boys. He's not only you know, framing this in terms of women's experiences, but constantly apologizing at the same time so as not to be appear offensive. <sighs> anyway, we, I think there needs to be a more, much more full-throated approach to this. So he says, uh, I'm, you know, I, I don't want to see be seen as uh, elevating Black men above Black women, even if that were possible, but just to help them to keep up. More needs to be done to clear the obstacles in the path of Black women. Right? See that? That wasn't even called for in a chapter on black men and boys. Now, this chapter is, it, it, hold on. This chapter on black men goes to page 59. Hold on. I want to get this in. All right. So, starts on page 45, goes to page 59. Right? 14 pages. And it's, and it's, rel it's extremely short in terms of this book. It's a real short chapter. But in that, still found a way to kind of prioritize women and girls on a section that should have been about men and boys unapologetically, right? But he says, more needs to be done to clear the obstacles in the path of black women. But even more now needs to be done for black men. This is not a zero-sum game and is vitally important that it is not framed as such as Moynihan did in a letter to President Johnson in 65. Men must have jobs. We must not rest until every able-bodied Negro male is working, he wrote, before adding fatally, even if we have to displace some of the females. Of course, Moynihan was writing more than half a century ago. He was also a white man and an established figure, but we should not just dismiss the comment. Even today, there is a fear that helping men means hindering women, whether by design or by happenstance. But it is not true. It is important to strive for equity in terms of gender, class, and race. As Heather McGee argues in her book, The Sum of Us, raising men up does not mean holding a woman down or displacing them. It means rising together. Okay. So how exactly do we rise together? when we can't critically talk about what's happened in the past. In other words, if you're going to talk about, um, you know, black family and in the economics therein and employment, so on and so forth, there are grievances that black men have not been allowed to voice in mainstream culture. And they're not being voiced here because again, even though he's saying that this is not a zero sum game, there's so much apologetics. There's so much about making sure that black women are not offended or women in, on, as a whole are not offended the grievances that black males themselves have had for generations are not met. They're not articulated in this short chapter, right? They're not because they're not a priority. The priority, of course, is to primarily focus on this question of equity, right? Now, he acknowledges that there is a need to help black men, but we got to make sure we don't push them beyond women. That's not even... That's not even relevant. That's not, and he even points out to it, it's not even positive. Shout out to Dr. Dunbar. What's up? It says, peace, happy new year, and keep up the good work. Likewise, I want to holler at you uh, about uh, some of the new stuff going on with synthetic weed. So I want to get with you, Dr. Dunbar, uh, and talk a little bit about that. I had a, a colleague reach out to me and tell me that her son is grappling with um, psychological issues as a response to synthetic weed. And that it's actually impacting kids' behavior and nobody's really making the connection. So I wanted to talk to Dr. Dunbar, hopefully get him on the show. Maybe he can tell us a little bit about what he might know uh, in regard to that. 
So if anybody knows any information or has anything on that, um, I know Wesley, uh, Dr. Wesley Muhammad dealt with it, but um, I, I'm hearing some more recent stuff and I don't know if it's still the same thing, if it's still spice or if it's something new. So um, let me know if you have any information about that and we'll go from there. Shout out to Andre, he says rising together while being actively sabotaged. Real talk, real talk. And that's one of the things that I'm trying to really focus on here, that there needs to be less of a concern about how people feel about foregrounding black men and boys in the conversation uh, and more about what exactly hasn't been discussed about black men and boys, right? Even if it's in a 14 page chapter, right? So anyway, there's a, hold on, let's skip ahead a little bit. He starts to deal with uh, education in another chapter called the non-responders. Hold on here. There we go. Page 73. And I skipped over a lot. So we can, we can always go back to the black male chapter at any point if anybody wants to discuss anything in there. And there's a lot in this book. He's talking about new gender economics. So we can actually spend some time going through that. I might do, uh, that might be a follow-up uh, section that I'll go with. Um, I'm looking at chapter six at this point. It's called non-responders. Policies aren't helping boys and men. So he's no longer talking specifically about black boys, even though I would argue about as much time talking about black girls. Anyway, let's see. I see salty balls in the house. What's good with you, man? Uh, 380 people watching. Like, hit the like button, please, if nothing else. Otherwise, uh, you can support in a lot of different ways that you're already familiar with. So please make sure you do so. Let's see here. Okay. Um, so in this chapter, uh, the the first now this is why I wanted to read this because in this first sentence you'll see why, right? So it says uh, so the chapter six non-responders policies aren't helping boys and men. And it starts and it reads: Women are just naturally smarter than men, and now they are on the rise. That's Jonathan, a college junior. We're discussing why women are doing so much better in college than men. You know, the motivation for men is just not there anymore. He adds, it's a mental thing. As Jonathan and I are talking over coffee in his hometown of Kalamazoo, Michigan, Kalamazoo is a special place, um, especially to policymakers, not because of the Glenn Miller song, I've Got a Gal in Kalamazoo, but because of its unique free college program. Thanks to uh, an anonymous uh, benefactor, students educated in the city's K-12 school system get all their tuition paid at almost any college in the, in the state. There are similar initiatives in other cities, but the Kalamazoo Promise is usually generous. It is, uh, it is also one of the very few to have been robustly evaluated by a trio of scholars at uh, the Upjohn Institute. Um, they find that the promise made a big difference, bigger than other promise type programs, but the average effect disguises a stark gender divide. The program put rocket boosters on female college completion rates, increasing the number of women getting a bachelor's degree by 45%, but men's rates didn't budge. A cost-benefit analysis shows an overall gain of 69000 per female participant, a return on investment of at least 12% compared to an overall uh, loss of 21000 for each man. In other words, it was expensive and didn't work. Let me get my little page holder here to act right. There we go. Uh, the philosopher uh, Bertrand Russell said that the mark of a civilized man was the ability to weep over a column of numbers. For a policy wonk, the numbers in these regression tables might just do it. But it's not just the Kalamazoo promise. I have discovered a startling number of social programs that seem to work well for girls and women, but not for boys and men. I described some of the, described some of them here. First in education and training, and then in job programs. This seems to be a big deal, but it's getting barely any attention, not least because almost nobody knows about it. I asked Brad Hirschbane. Uh, what was behind the massive gender gap in Kalamazoo? Because he's a true scholar, Brad's answer is we don't know. What he means is that the gap cannot be explained statistically, at least with easily observable factors like test scores or family background. As I noted in chapter one, there's still a good deal of mystery surrounding the worst educational outcomes for men. But I think Jonathan is on the right track with his observation about the mental thing. If we want answers, we won't find them in the metrics, but in the minds of young men themselves, this is one reason I went to Kalamazoo to meet some of the men 
the promise is designed to help, maybe they would know why I did not. Shout out to Mike. He says, I thank the Manosphere for giving us a platform to have honest conversations. Finally, we have a place to express our needs and find solutions. Appreciate that. Yeah. And I should have said the Black Manosphere is what, what he actually said. Um, I use Manosphere because I, I don't really listen to the White Manosphere much. So to me, the Manosphere is the Black Manosphere. But I do need to be clear because those are distinct categories. Now, what he's saying in this section, you know, is that whether in regard to education or job placement, there's a critical gender divide, even in areas where much of this in regard to higher education is funded and they don't know why. And they're trying to figure out why. And there are a lot of different possible reasons, even a lot of ones we've covered in these spaces. BGS himself has covered. But I think the ones I gravitate more to have to do with the culture of education, especially from K through 12. Right. Elementary school system, you have over 90 percent female teachers. The very, uh, you know, curriculum itself and the pedagogy, right, even the culture of how things are taught in the classroom are very much suited to girls' sensibilities. Sitting, being quiet, learning. I call boys far more on the average tactile learners. Right. Boys are going to get up. They're going to put their hands on things. They want to move. These are these are the kind of subtle things that I think get swept in the rug under. I don't know. But I do think it's important that we actually raise the question about how boys learn, and in particular, black boys, right? Um, we know that there are scholars who have been out for generations who have really looked at this question. Um, let me see. Ah, dang it. Hold on. Uh, there we go. Sorry. Had a little screen quirk. Uh, screen quirk. Um, but Juwanza Kunjufa, for example has multiple books over years where he studied black boys down to what temperature the classroom should be. Let me actually see. Let me see if Juwanza is at all cited in this book. Let me see. And he does. He cites them on page 55 one time. Okay, let me see. I just want to see what the citation was. <laughs> okay, there we go. Um, let me see. Many black men suffer from post-traumatic missing daddy disorder, according to, according to Juwanza Kunjufu, author of Raising Black Boys. Okay. So he's basically uh, cited Juwanza Kunjufu once on the notion of missing black boys, but what Kunjufu has done in his study of educational needs, particularly for black boys, for that to be the only citation is laughable in regard to that. But my point in raising this is, you know, I think what we're talking about, because education is the starting point, right? It's, it's what we were all forced to do from a very young age in an environment where uh, even if the predominant you know, the parental figures in your home weren't women, which for many of us, they were, you went to a school where the predominant figures were women. And the culture of learning was highly centered around what seems to be girls' learning styles, far less so from boys, even down to the reading material. I read articles about this that where they don't want to actually foreground the kinds of stuff that boys are interested in reading. So when it comes to early reading, you find boys at a young age already disinterested, mainly based on what they choose to read. This is why I, as you can see with the swords on the wall, was a comic book head. One of the things that really pushed me away from other students was because I loved to read. But what I loved to read were comic books. They were, they were, at the time, books that were actually tailored to a male population. And they dealt with the things that males like to, like to do. They dealt with superheroism, strength, intelligence, strategy, competition, warfare, the kind of topics that interested boys. And now boys are being shamed out of wanting to engage in, right? The comic industry, as an example, is sought, they're seeking to undermine it to make it more friendly to a female market that's never asked for it. And the reason, one of the reasons they do it is to tamp down at masculinity and to try and provide this kind of equity focus where now, although I think it's moved past equity, you have this kind of framework where girls are presented in comic books and comic movies as smarter, stronger, better, more skilled, more patient, more capable, so on and so forth, simply because they have vaginas. 
And it's often not even due to training. It's simply because they exist. And this is the message that boys have been getting. So in schools where that kind of material might actually activate boys and making them want to listen, far too many schools will avoid it altogether and only focus on the kinds of materials that girls are far more interested in reading. So the culture of the classroom, the nature of the, the pedagogy, the, the nature of the curriculum itself, and those administering it, both on an educational and administrative level, being overwhelmingly female, we're going to sit here and act like this wouldn't have an impact on boys? Really? I started this video today showing you just a one-on-one -on -one contact with a black male teacher and a black male student. It took place in under, what, a minute? You're going to tell me that this wouldn't have an impact on boys altogether? But see, that would cause, that would, there would need to be a massive program, a massive shift in policy that would prioritize actually hiring males. And in doing so, you'd have to meet their needs to attract them in. And of course, we've been having a trouble, having trouble attracting teachers, which I think was highlighted during the pandemic, and it's only gotten worse. Let me see. Passport OG says, uh, making black boys read Little Women. Never understood why I needed to read that book. Yeah. You know, I wanted to read books at a young age that were a little more related to black folk. And I wasn't even, you know, into, you know, reading anything. I mean, as early as fourth and fifth grade, I wanted to kind of do that. But I didn't know what to read. You know, at the schools I went to, we read stuff like White Fang. Now, the thing about it is Jack London, White Fang, it, it wasn't related to black folk in any degree. But it still dealt with issues I was interested in, wolves and, you know, hunting. And they, those things were attractive to me. But alongside of that, I, I'm still reading comic books. And the key, the reading factor is key, whether you're talking about math, science, so on and so forth. It all comes down to reading, especially at a young age. And that's become something that is not interesting, especially to a lot of boys, even though one can argue it's a generational issue, too, because the subject matter uh, of what boys are asked to read doesn't often appeal to them. Now, I can say as a parent, I've also noticed that it's hard to get a kid to sit down and read um, after playing video games. The video game culture we have now is not conducive to reading either. The reading doesn't give you the same kind of high, the, the dopa, dopamine rush, the lights, the activity. I noticed that anytime I pulled my son off a video game and told him to read a book, he'd be asleep within 10 minutes because it was just too slow. Didn't hold his interest. What I ended up having to do was make him read first. And he had to read a certain amount before he could play video games, especially in the summer, it was just he and I in the house. And I couldn't afford at the time to take him anywhere to do too much. So we stayed at home a lot of the time. And I wanted him to read more. The only way I could really do that was to make sure he read before he picked up, you know, a controller. I made it a reward. You know, and that kind of changed the game. And he even told me last semester how reading, me forcing him to read, uh, actually changed uh, his focus and, and made it easier. Make what he's going through now in college so much easier because he's seeing a lot of his classmates who have not been acculturated to reading. Whereas for him, it's a lot more normalized, right? But I also made adjustments in what I wanted him to read. I'm not going to say he liked everything, but the point of the matter is it was it was also shaped around his experience as a young man. And I think that changed a lot for him in terms of that. So reading becomes key. But again, if we're going to talk about employment and higher education, you got to start with K through 12. And if the boys are, are, are treated as second, second class citizens, especially when we're teaching that masculinity is inherently toxic, right, and problematic in and of itself, you are disadvantaging these boys on levels that are unparalleled and make it that much more, you know, disconcerting for young men. Now, by the time you graduate high school, if you graduate high school, there are certain sensibilities that are kind of locked in place. And I think one of the things that we don't talk about is girls walk away with a sense that there is a system and there is a safety net and there is an overall concern for their well-being. Right? If they fail, there are systems in place to catch them. This is what I think happens when you are prioritized in the educational system. Right? What happens if the subtle lesson you've been learning from kindergarten through 12th grade is that you're secondary? And if we're talking about black boys, you're pushed into special ed, not necessarily because you need to be there, 
but because you are an, an annoyance, you are an issue. Now, I'm not saying that's always the case, but I am saying that I have even witnessed boys who have been, been pushed out simply because the teacher didn't want to deal with them or the teacher made assumptions. It even happened with my own son. Right? Same one that they, you know, the first week of kindergarten, they were trying to push him into special ed. First week. This kid was reading 500 page, you know, uh, Harry Potter books on his own, but they wanted to put him in special ed. Had nothing to do with his capabilities, had nothing to do with his skill set, had everything to do with the fact that they didn't want to be bothered. And when I would sit in the class, now, of course, my son's going to act a little different when I'm sitting there. But what I noticed is everything they told me he did in class, I saw every group of kids doing. But we've seen the data and we know that teachers in and of themselves tend to, you know, pejority, pejoratively look at black males more anyway. So a lot of that has more to do with implicit bias than it simply has to do with their behavior. But I would, I can see that both are involved still. My point here is that black boys in particular are maligned from the beginning. And you're already in a system that is teaching you over time that you are not really a priority, that you're not their concern and that you don't matter. And I remember that in K through 12, let alone what's going on now. That's before it was even compounded by COVID. But my point is. By the time you graduate and you become, you move into young adulthood and independence, whether you go to college or not, if you've been condi conditioned with a sense that you are not relevant, that the system may or may not even exist for you, there is no safety net for you, how exactly do you, you move with a confidence that you belong there? Go, go to any homeless population in any major city and you tell me who you see there more often. Women or men? Men can all tell you, I just did this with a friend of mine earlier today. Most men can tell you the two or three things that could happen to them right now that would send them, onto a, send them to sleep under a bridge. Most men are constantly aware. And the reason for that is there aren't, aren't a whole lot of networks. There aren't a whole lot of, of, of safety nets to prevent you from ending, ending up having to do that. I go to downtown Fresno, I see people walking around with carts, overwhelmingly male, overwhelmingly male. And they can tell you how they got there. And most men I know can tell you how they themselves could end up there. And there's no social expectation. There's no, there's not even a personal expectation that somebody's going to come save them. Somebody's not going to help. Men don't even apply for grants, fellowships, scholarships, programs. Uh, it, you know, men don't even apply for those things, generally speaking, with any sense that it's a, a supposed to happen dynamic, right? Like, no. Even black male academics that I know are less likely to take time off to do research or to get into programs that, that will pull them out of the classroom so they can do. When I talk to brothers about those things, there are a select few that are doing that. But much of the time, brothers are doing their work on top of what's expected of them in the classroom. Again. What I'm saying that comes from is being acculturated to the idea that you don't have any stake in this society to any great degree. You don't have any stake in the educational system. And if you're getting that as a child, what do you think you're going to get as an adult? So what he's saying in this section is there are all kinds of programs that are available, right, where he's talking about. And he's wondering why men are, are not availing themselves. So he talks about a training program in Milwaukee. Right, funded as a public-private venture, had a positive statistical, statistically significant impact on employment rates and earnings for participating women at the two-year mark, but not for men. Program for dislocated workers, funded by the Workforce Investment Act. Value training also had great long-run, uh, long-run positive impacts on earnings and employment for women, but not for men. And he lists out several other bullet-pointed programs along the same lines, and they're constantly wondering. Why boys and men aren't even taking advantage of. There's no sense that that can, you know, when my son was getting ready to graduate high school, one of the things that women told me on a regular basis, most particularly mothers and educators, was well, make sure you apply for scholarships. Make sure you apply for scholarships. But when I would ask fathers and young men how they felt about applying for scholarships, the difference I noticed in how girls and women saw it Girls and women saw it as a useful and strong possibility and something that they needed 
and would help them graduate. Boys and men looked at it like it's a gesture. But the goal was I got to figure out how I can pay for what I got to do if I never get it, because the likelihood of getting so, you know, I'm saying the thought process was radically different. There was nothing that on a regular basis coming up from kindergarten through high school gave them the sense that these were real possibilities that they could enjoy and were a regular part of their reality. There was no sense of that. Right. Um, shout out to Mr. Shane Vicious. He says uh, there's a system is set. Uh, there is a system set up to assist men. It's called prison. Hey, this is what we're looking at. How many of you grew up with a sense that if you applied for an application, I mean, if you applied for a scholarship or a fellowship that you, you know, you had a strong possibility of getting it. Or you had a lot of homeboys that got them. So you knew you'd get them. Right? Word. I never did. And I got a few. But truthfully, my attitude going into it, matter of fact, I, I damn near had to be yelled at <laughs> by mentors to apply for the ones I did. And overwhelmingly, you know, it wasn't a reality. I got a couple of key ones, you know, that I was happy about. I found out later that one particular one I got when I was uh, in graduate school had a lot to do with the fact that I had a mentor who was on the decision making board. Now, it, it, it he didn't make that decision himself. He actually uh, stepped out. He stepped off because it was a conflict of interest. And he revealed to the board that I was his mentee. I was his, his grad student. He was on my committee, but he had a conversation with a couple of his colleagues, you know, and they advocated for me. That had never happened before. And it's never happened since. It was a one-time issue, one-time uh, event, it's not a regular occurrence by any means. But what I noticed in that is he kept asking me what I thought and, and, and was I confident I was going to get him. I forgot I even applied. That's how realistic th those things were to me. But here's the point. If I didn't know him or if he didn't make that decision to advocate on my behalf, it would have been like any other cold application I put forward. And this is what I'm getting at when in regard to men. If you condition a population of boys and young men with a sense that none of these things work in their favor, none of these things are accessible resources that will help enough of them to where it's a common uh, conversation, excuse me, common conversation that this is something that they can have. This is something they can uh, re reach. This is something accessible to them. If you condition them to believe that none of this shit is a reality, what are they going to believe in? Now with girls, it's a different conversation. Girls tend to be far more confident about applying to these things. They have far more of a sensibility that if they don't get this, something will help. Someone will come help. They have this kind of sensibility. Boys, I often find don't. Men, I often find don't. Is that an accident? Is that a coincidence across the board? In an environment where the majority of people involved are female? But we're going to ignore that, though, right? You know, uh, let me see what some of y'all are talking about here. Hmm. So Donnie says, we're accused of benefiting from the good old boy system that was never built for us. Real talk. Real talk. Yeah. Tyrone says a lot of boys and a lot of men and boys have lost hope. Or never had it in the first place. Right. How are you going to have it if you've never been included? Um, okay, so Rogish, uh, shout out to Rogish, what's up, man, says uh, they have to be uh, brought to seeing why the learning process is important for them to participate in, merely to be able to pay attention to. He says uh, they have to be shown outside of the standard that they are presented, that there there is merit for them personally investing in the venture. Okay. Shout out to Growth Talk with Kofa. Support the Growth Talk channel. I hope you're well, good brother. He says, as a single father, you were spot on our feelings about scholarships. When I actually looked, um, the first three I found were specific, specified for single mothers. Discouragement set in. I didn't apply. Look, man, I just ran across. Hold on. One second. Um, okay. Dang it. Uh, not the right one. 
Okay. Mm. So I just ran across, um, uh, what was it, last night on Facebook. I was trying to see if I could find it, but um, I didn't, I should have shared the page. And what it was, it, what it was, somebody was sharing with me a list of um, scholarships, grants, and programs for men, right? For black men, actually. And so somebody, the brother who wrote me, he said, look, doc, they finally, you know, disproved your point. They finally, you know, they're, they're, here's a critical list of scholarships and grants for black men. So I went to the page. What it was, was a list of scholarships, grants, and programs that anybody could apply to. None of the literature had anything to do with black males except for one. The one that had to do with black males was not a grant institute, a grant, uh, uh, um, uh, what do you call it? A grant giving institution. In other words, there were no resources extended. And I'm only talking about the list uh, that was presented on that page. And most of them were presented in the in comment section. So, you know, there's all these lists of different programs and scholarships one could apply for. And when we went through item by item by item by item, none of them were exclusive to black men. None of them were even exclusive to men. None of them even mentioned men. They were just programs that were open. That was it. And for the longtime listeners of the show, you know, since 2020, I've been asking for people to actually put forth scholarships and grants that you find that are actually earmarked for black men. The most I found was that there were a few that were in process, right? There, was, there were grants, there were scholarships. These were in process. I found one that was uh, actually defunct, one that I, I don't know if they actually started it. They advertised it, uh, but it no longer works. I mean, it, it, this is the kind of thing we're talking about. So I'm saying that in response to the kind of environment that starts in education, but even begins to metastasize and impact later employment issues, one of the things you're going to have to do is you're going to have to change the culture for boys and men. There's going to have to be a sense of possibility, a sense that they belong, a sense that they participate in a system that is concerned about them. And right now, I'm talking across the, 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 the racial spectrum for boys, because across race, boys aren't doing that great in the K through 12 uh, system. They're really not. Across race. Now, obviously, black boys tend to be at the bottom end of that, and I will always advocate for them first. Because that's my primary interest. That's my primary concern. But my point here is simply that there is no culture overall that tells boys that they matter and that they are a part of society. And this is one of the reasons why the, the frustration I mentioned before, the, the parents who find that their young baby has turned into a pissed off teenager, a lot of that subtle, a, a lot of what they missed on a subtle level is the degree to which their boys are not made to feel like they belong. There's no sense of belonging. They're being told they're toxic. They're being told they're irrelevant. They're not being shown that they are invited to participate. If anything, they're being pushed to the side. And it's not happening, and it doesn't have to happen in an overt fashion. If you got a population of boys uh, who are primarily, you know, conditioned in an environment that's primarily female based they don't have to be told that they're toxic and they're not, they're unwanted they can feel it they can see it it's having a direct response and they don't like it yeah so here's what i'm going to do um there's a video that i could not play in the last show i did where i was talking about um self care and what I was saying, self-care for black men starts at removing the toxicity out of your life. And I gave 10 different examples of how that toxicity could present itself as it pertains to women. Um, but there was a video I wanted to play and I couldn't because um, I couldn't find it in that moment. I've since found it, but the problem is uh, based on the music in it, I can't play it for copyright purposes. Now, I'm going to play it anyway right now. But I do have to preface it a bit so you can understand what's happening. It's, you know, it's about 30 seconds long. It's a TikTok video. Um, and actually, the music really, really makes it. Really, the music really does make it. But again, I can't play it. So I am going to share that with you. And what we'll do from there is we'll call it a day. But I will actually wait for you to tell me 
if you want us to do a part two, and if there's anything of focus, you know, any any kind of focus you want me to kind of use in this, because there's plenty more to cover. I'm just skimming. Uh, I just looked at, you know, just really half of two chapters. And we can de we can de definitely do a deeper dive. But this is the video that I have posted on Facebook. Some of you may have seen it. And it's a brother, you know, that's sitting in his apartment. And I'm playing it without sound on purpose because I don't want any copyright issues. Uh, my comment when I posted it was, uh, I said, yes, a shift is occurring and it's beautiful. I'm so proud of my brothers. This is a state you want to reach before negotiating a relationship, if at all. Right. And so just playing it. He's chilling in his apartment. His girl reaches out, says she wants to come through. And he says, nah. And she says, why not? Why can't I come? He says, because I'm at peace. You see him getting his stuff together. You know what I'm saying? Got his hookah game together. Chilling on his couch. Relaxing. Lounging. Now, that was all. And like I said, the music really does make it. Really, the music really pushes you there. I think in a, in a good way, but I wanted to just kind of put that up there for those who asked in the last, uh, you know, stream, what I was presenting, what I was basically trying to say that really summed up a lot of what the entire show was about. Removing toxicity from your life, taking the time to prioritize your sense of peace. See this, that too is something that's difficult to come to. If your primary concern is making sure you don't piss off anybody else who may not like the fact that we're even having a conversation about boys and men. But when you're actually invested in that, again, it doesn't have to be a derogatory statement toward women, girls, or anybody else, but we can actually focus more so on what's needed. And I would say far too many brothers don't know how to actually prioritize their peace. We're socialized to carry the load, lift people up around us, be a good man. And there's a lot of connotations to that we can get into. All I'm asking brothers to do is to actually learn what it is you need for peace. That brother knew for him, a hookah, couch, a couple of TV shows, lounging in his house, relaxing. That was his peace. You know what I'm saying? Do you know what yours is? Do you know what brings you peace? And do you ritualistically practice it? And by ritualistic, I simply mean on a regular basis, on an established, irregular basis. Do you do that? Do you know how? Because I've just covered the degree to which we're not taught how to do it and nobody else does. They expect of black men and boys, but who actually prioritizes you, your well-being, your peace and the possibilities of your life? Who prioritizes that in a fashion that benefits you and is conducive to long term functional, you know, kind of advancement in the world? Who, 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 who prioritizes that for you? These boys are not being prioritized. They're being dismissed. And they're dismissed as men as much as they were as boys, if not more so. At the very least, do you know how to prioritize yourself when needed? Do you know how to take time away to do what you need to do to do that? Is it fishing? Is it smoking cigars? Is it running? Do you know what it is for you? And do you prioritize it? Because that's the other thing. As soon as you figure it out, it doesn't mean everything's over. You might still push it to the background and not prioritize you simply because we're told we got to do everything else. Look, this, this shout out to Growth Talk. Look what he's talking about. I sit in my garage or my backyard with a cigar and enjoy the piece of it to the full. As simple as that sounds, how many brothers do you think know what their piece is, what it is that brings them peace? I don't know. My suspicion is that too many don't. So I am proud when I see brothers doing that. That's what I meant when I played that Facebook clip. That's what I mean when I see stuff like this right now. Beef King says I do it every day. I'm proud to see it because I grew up at a time period where I, I never heard black men talk about what brought them peace. Never. Andre, shout out to you. Part two. Will do. You can definitely do that. And if you have specific things in the book, if you've read it, you can definitely let me know. If you have questions based on what we covered today, 
and there's something you'd like me to delve into more, you know, we can do that. Hell, there's a few things that I want to cover more, and I know I'll, I know so already. Um, but I just wanted to get this kind of started. I want to spend a little time on Reeves. I didn't want to rush it through too much, so I'm gonna I'm gonna spend more time on it. Um, shout out to Dr. Dunbar. He says yes, you have to defend it. You absolutely do. But the hardest part sometimes is figuring out what brings you peace, and that that's the case when you've not been told that uh, this is something you should even prioritize. That said, so we're going to stop there tonight. We will do a part two. Um, and remember, Sunday night, BJS and I are going to get together and do a viewing of Leave the World Behind that you can catch on Patreon live and we can have some conversations. So just make sure that you become a patron at the five dollar mark. Come on through and uh, we can chop it up. Um, let me see. And we will go from there. So, oh, look at that. Shout out to Malika. Exercise, comics, movies, reading, and documentaries. There you go. And there's no judgment on what it is, man. I just want to know if you know what it is. Have you taken enough time to prioritize your well-being enough to know what brings you peace? And then the second question is, do you practice it? Do you make sure that time is allotted for you to do that? A lot of people don't. A lot of men don't. So shout out to Malika, you know, that's what's up. Look at Hurricane Greg. See, I listen to jazz music, gives me peace of mind. See what I'm saying? That's what's up. That's what's up. I want you to practice it. Uh, Joe's. Oh, whoop. screen moved up on me. There we go. Game, cooking, and soon farming. That's what's up. That's what's up. Uh, Lewis says one hour, one hour of call of duty every night. <laughs> I ain't mad at you, man. Uh, shout out to Detroit says driving is my piece. Then PlayStation and reading. Yeah. Yeah. Blood crow puts it uh, very straightforward. Many brothers don't know, uh, their piece until they're six feet under. You know what I'm saying? Uh, Andre says, uh, my piece is spending time with my daughter, gaming or listening to men like this. Much appreciated. Much appreciated. Um, Kadash says, I'm not going to lie. I'm just now learning to do this at 38. Better late than never. See, this is what I'm talking about. We don't. It's not something we're told. It's not something we're, we're urged to do. My, oh, a good brother of mine, he started going to spas. And it was actually his wife. He um he was a nationalist brother, and he did not marry a black woman. And I'm not saying that that's the solution. I'm simply telling you his story. He found a woman that fit outside of the framework of his nationalism, which was uncomfortable for him at first. But one of the things he noticed is that she was extremely concerned with his peace. She felt that he worked too hard and that he didn't prioritize taking a break or finding anything peaceful to do. So what she started to do is um, she started to send him to spas middle of the day. He'd come home um, and she, you know, she just would be like, honey, get in the car. And eventually he learned not to question it. He'd get in the car. She'd take him to a spa, drop him off. He already had a scheduled time, a certain number of hours he was supposed to be there and a number of the services that were already ticked off and paid for. And one of the things he found was that the only people there at the spa were women. There were no men there. He was the only one. And they looked at him like he was from Mars, simply because he was there. And she had to force him to kind of do it until he began to enjoy it, because it's not something we're socialized to do, right? So um, this is one of the things that, that you know, he, he began to do, and she still supports him to, it, uh, to do it now. It's 10 years later. Um, and they also do a lot of RVing, you know, they found peace in that. So sometimes he'll come home, she's loaded up the van, put in all the food, packed all the bags. And she does it because she knows if she leaves him to his devices, he will work just seven days a week. So she does it because she knows he's not going to do it for himself. And it, it's taught him how to relax. It flicks says drawing. I haven't done it on a regular since my twenties. Now I can't stop. Now you're speaking my language. You know, drawing, I used to sit there, if it was in the summer, especially, I'd draw 18 hours a day just sitting on the floor or, or I'd go to a mall and start drawing, drawing and I'd look up 
and there'd be 40, 50 people standing around me just watching me make a line, you know, on something I was working on. That used to be my piece. And now, I, you know, I drive to the coast and I watch the sundown. I watch the sunset. That's what brings me peace. You know, I listen to music. That's what brings me peace. Um, and especially now that I'm here at the house by myself, I turn the music up and blast it. And I don't got to worry about what, <laughs> whether or not it's keeping, keeping somebody up and they can't go to school or whatever. I'm just blasting my music. But that brings me peace. Know what it is. Look at that. A 9-6 gardening. That's what's up. <laughs> Wanna be mystic says listening to BGS Idmore while playing Fallout 3. <laughs> That's what's up. Uh AC says working out and creating music and poetry. That's what I'm saying, man. That's what I'm saying. Right. Uh Detroit says, also over the road is my piece with semi truck. Okay. You know. Uh ghetto user. Shout out to ghetto user. Says the word of God, music, and your podcast. Damn. <laughs> Damn, I appreciate that. That's powerful. Um, look at that. J Block, backyard looking at nature. That's real. Chef Mike, every Sunday on the beach with a cigar while watching my daughters play. That's what I'm talking about. Detroit, also working out, lifting 100 pound weights. You know, Passport says, uh, for me, jazz and studying language. That's what it, see, there we go. Right? Um, that's what I'm looking at. LXST says God of War. You know what I'm saying? Says coding, reading books, listening to the podcasts and documentaries. Dr. Dunbar says my mother likes to guilt me and my brother into not being alone. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Kadash says gaming, listening to jazz and cooking. Real talk. Shout out to Artisan. What's good with you, man? Um, Yeah. You're going to be discouraged from doing it. I want you to do it. Sincere says, I appreciate that support. He says, I find peace in writing and performing poetry at open mic. Real talk. If that's what works for you. Cooking, especially after moving to my own place. Yep, exactly. Um, let's see. <laughs> but like it says, all music from Prince, definitely peace. <laughs> okay. Right. Growth Talk says there are so many things while smoking a good cigar, gaming, reading, jazz, writing. Right. Festus says uh, learning piano, making music. Look, man, take these as suggestions. If you haven't found yours, if you have found it, practice it because nobody is really going to come force you to do it um, on a regular basis. But it's necessary for us to do it really is. Um Regardless of how much longer you got on this earth, this is definitely something we got to learn to do and we got to do it religiously. Right. So anyway, um, we will do a part two uh, again, right in the comment section. Uh, let me know what it is you'd like to cover. If you got any things you want me to focus on. But other than that, we'll kind of stop there for now. And uh, I'm going to go cook with my son. So I hope you all are well. Thank you for coming through tonight. And. Uh, we will definitely get it going. So y'all have a good one. All right. Peace. I'm just here to tell you, brother, we are not criminals by birth, criminal rapists, incapable intellects, man children, sperm donors, child support wellsprings, success objects, walking fallacies, ATM machines, lottery tickets, unintelligent henchmen. Valueless assassins, pro bono mercenaries, unpaid bodyguards, interchangeable stepfathers, child discipline proxies, unpaid repairmen, workhorses, emotional tampons, or any other socially accepted dehumanizing stereotype. We are thinkers, inventors, innovators, leaders, fathers, and men. Embrace your humanity, know your worth, and extend your time, attention, and resources only to those who genuinely respect you. And remember, your worth is not defined by meeting other people's narcissistic, selfish, and unrealistic needs. You define your worth. Peace.